I'm Jamie Colby, and today I'm driving along the Southern California coastline in San Diego. I'm here to meet a woman who says her strange inheritance took her on a journey to meet someone she never really got to know when he was alive, her own father. My name is Nancy Crego Powers, and my father, Arthur V. Crego, left a collection that took him a lifetime to accumulate. For starters, Nancy asked me to check out the oldest item in her father's collection. I want to show you where I keep the gun. In the bedroom? In the bedroom. Uh, yeah, that could be dangerous. Oh, look at that. It's so beautiful with the inlay. It's called a Pennsylvania long rifle. Handmade in Philadelphia. It's probably circa 1776 or a little later. This was still being used in the Battle of 1812. It meant so much to him, and it means a lot to me. Nancy's family has a history of military service going back to the Revolutionary War. This is one of dozens of firearms and a huge cache of war relics left by Nancy's father when he died in 2010. Born in 1922 in a small town along New York's Hudson River, Art Krigo, an intense, scholarly boy, grows up fantasizing with his friends about military adventures. We have pictures of him in makeshift World War I uniforms. I understand from a, a friend of my dad's, they were called Krigo's Army, and my dad was always in charge. Art's reenacting is encouraged by his mother, who buys him odds and ends at garage sales. She had interest in history, and I think that he got some of that from her. Here he is all dressed up in full Civil War regalia. How young is he here in this picture? I'm guessing he's about 16. Probably ordered all this stuff, and it cost him less than $20. When World War II breaks out, Art enters the famed Citadel Military College in South Carolina. It's there he falls in love with a vivacious 18-year-old named Janet Wade. My mother was attending the University of uh, South Carolina and they met at a dance. Art and Janet get serious fast and tie the knot. Shortly after D-Day, Art is shipped off to France as an infantryman in the final push to defeat Nazi Germany. You can tell how excited he was to be a part of our fighting force. He was very proud to be uh, attached to Patton's 10th Armored. That was the most important thing, that he was under Patton, and he admired Patton immensely. Art gets his chance to head a real Krigo's army as a squad leader during the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. American troops hold back a last-ditch German counteroffensive. He was right there on the front lines. During a two-week period, 500 men in Art's command unit are killed in action. He receives a marksmanship award and a Bronze Star Medal for bravery. He decides to pursue a career in the military. War comes calling again, and Art is ordered to Korea as an Ordnance Company Commander. 1953 appears, and he was gone in Korea until I was a year old. Two more children follow as Art and his family move from one post to the next. For a while, Art teaches military history at Louisiana State and writes scholarly papers on Civil War artifacts. But during this period, trouble develops on the home front as Art's wife Janet starts showing signs of bipolar disorder. There were weeks that she wouldn't get out of bed. And so here's dad working full time and you know, he's doing laundry and everything else. Your dad had so much to handle at home. Do you think collecting became an escape? Somebody else would pick up a book or watch a movie, but for him, it was his collection. He keeps receipts for just about everything. For a few hundred dollars, he buys this rare Bill Harz and Hall rising breech carbine made for the Confederate Army. Using his skills as a military historian, Art is able to turn the serial numbers on the weapons into the stories behind them. 
It was like a good mystery novel that he had to know the answer. Well, who was this person that owned this? Where had this man served? What battles had he been in? For a few bucks, he buys these Pennsylvania Reserve Brigade belt buckles and these shell jackets. He paid five dollars. He paid ten dollars. I mean, you could see in the receipts how much he paid for this stuff. This strange item cost him less than a hundred dollars from a war surplus dealer in the early 1960s. It's a tree trunk scarred with Civil War ammunition. It was usually wrapped in a blanket with twine in a bathtub. In a bathtub. In a bathtub. That's where it usually sat. By 1969, Lieutenant Colonel Krigo has served his country in France, Belgium, Germany, Korea, and Thailand. He's ready to retire. He and Janet set up home one last time here along the California coast in Carmel. Art's collection continues to swell with swords, insignias, and other military gear. Nancy doesn't even notice that because her mom has taken to indiscriminate hoarding. Before long, nobody has any idea what's in the house. The house was full of stuff. There was stuff everywhere. After her mother dies in 2003, Nancy comes to see a side of her father that she had never appreciated. The curious intellectual, the writer, the romantic war historian. My dad's memory was sharp. He could tell you the year, he could tell you where it was manufactured. He just knew it. Nancy decides she'll help her father catalog his collection. Ultimately, she'll have to call in reinforcements. It was overwhelming. It was just falling out of closets and cupboards. And you'd open up a trunk and there'd just be guns wrapped in newspaper from the 1950s. That's next. But first, our strange inheritance quiz question. What was the most lethal weapon used during the Civil War? Was it the bayonet, the muzzle-loading rifle, or the cannon? The answer in a moment. <laughs> 